I've played tons of NES games, and while I don't associate them with being relaxing, some people might find them relaxing. We all have our own little way of processing the information that's provided to us, and what might be relaxing to you might not be relaxing to me, and the other way around. Nintendo Hard was an era that didn't really afford opportunities to veg out to the simpler aspects of gaming, but today I want to be talking about what I consider, in my opinion, to be the top 10 most relaxing NES games on the platform. Again, you might not agree, but maybe you'll provide a little insight to me as a person, or who knows, maybe we'll share some common ground. Let's begin. Growing up, I didn't play as much NES as I would want to. Dad had it for a little while before he decided to exchange it for a Sega Genesis, which was also relatively short-lived because he was afraid of me becoming addicted to video games. Which uh, panned out well, didn't it? One of the games he bought for me as a kid was Joust, a game from Williams that was on the same cartridge as Defender. It was a little collection on the Game Boy. And as a kid, it was one of my favorite games. I'm kind of sad that I lost it, but it is what it is. Balloon Fight brings me back to that era of gaming because it is 100% Joust. Joust came out in 1982, and Balloon Fight came out two years later in 1984. The similarities are very much there, and if you've played this one, you've played the other. Basically, we play as a balloon fighter, flapping his wings with the intention of popping the balloons of the enemies, which we do by hitting our feet on their balloons. The same can be said for our balloons, which can be popped if the enemies come above us. At the bottom of the screen are Piranha, who will grab you if you get too close, and all in all, if you ask me, this is a wonderful time waster, and the simplicity of it makes it super relaxing to me. The NES was filled to the brim with platformers. If you had a licensed medium, be it a movie, a film, a novel, even in some cases a public service announcement, if that character ever walked in its life, there's about an 80% chance that LJN, Acclaim, or Ocean would pick it up and set a budget that could not accurately translate the source material into an NES game. To me, the only exception was companies that were incredibly keen on understanding how the NES was programmed. We're talking Micronix versus, say, Atlas. The latter is more cognizant on how they developed games. But if you had a strong publisher, one that could provide creative direction, set solid expectations, and more importantly, give you the money that you need, you can create a great game. Hudson Soft published Felix the Cat. The developer was Shimada Kikaku, which as a name you probably don't care about, but they did port the Bard's Tale in Japan to the NES, which was a massive game, as well as Robocop on the Famicom, but we don't talk about that one. The important game to me is Felix the Cat, because it's so creative and fun and whimsical. It's just charming, and that's not something I can say about many games on the NES. Most companies wanted to be edgy or funny, and that came at the expense of quality control. The game as a platformer directly reflects the character, and our whole objective is to find our girlfriend who was kidnapped. No more, no less. Puzzle games by design, to me, have their own unique effect on me. Now, they might not have an effect on you. In fact, you might hate puzzle games, and I couldn't blame you. Most of the time, the charm of puzzle games tend to fade out after a little while. Dr. Mario cherry-picked tons of elements from games that pre-existed. This is the era of Tetris, and Tetris took the world by storm, for good reason. You might even see it on this list. Wink, wink. Other games that played a role in some capacity are Sega's Columns, which focused on color matching, or the big one, Puyo Puyo, which to me, most color matching games owe their roots to Puyo Puyo, or Puzzle Out Kids if you're from the US. Dr. Mario is a simple game with a simple soundtrack, and our whole job is to lob pills at viruses, and we just kind of sit back and enjoy the ride. Now, I will say Dr. Mario, to me, isn't the most fun I could have on the NES, especially given that I prefer other puzzle games. But if you want to have a relaxing time, this is a great start. Have you ever heard of Solomon's Key? This is the second game in the franchise, but it's a prequel to the story. 
Essentially, an old lady is telling a story to her grandchildren, and it takes place on Cool Mint Island. This evil wizard named Droodal pops up and decides to become a relevant issue, and the Queen of Fairies says, Not today, Fireboy! and summons Dana and Apprentice Wizard to defeat them, giving him the power of ice to counteract Droodal's forces of fire. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the best looking NES games and it almost made a list I did previously talking about the best looking NES games. And if you wanna check out that episode, I'll link it down below and at the end of this episode. This game is so much fun. I've always enjoyed puzzle games because more often than not, they don't involve lives. So you can just constantly try and try again to solve the puzzles. And when you figure it out, you crack a little smile and you say, oh, I should have known that. And you move on, right? You'll have 10 worlds each with 10 stages and it'll be over before you know it. But just so you know, if you want more levels, there is a cheat code to unlock 50 more bonus stages, or you could just create your own. True story. To me, Adventures of Lolo as a series has always hit the mark for a good solid time, but I know it's not for everyone. In fact, I think in some ways it might get extremely boring fast, but to me this is a really fun game and even more fun series. Now I'm looping all three of them together for this one because the series has always remained fundamentally the same, all the way back to when it was known as Eggerland for the MSX home computer. The game boils down to turning enemies into spheres and taking advantage of those spheres to block certain enemies, and you really need to check it out to understand it. The best one on the NES, in my opinion, is The Adventures of Lolo 3 because we aren't limited to a capped number of lives as compared to the other ones. And because this is a trial and error puzzle game, you're gonna restart a lot. And I hate games that charge you lives to reset, so if you wanna avoid that, play Lolo 3. I've mentioned Kickle Cubicle quite often. In fact, I know one of our viewers suggested a top 10, top 10 videos. <laughs> and I think it'd be cool to do a best of the best on the NES at some point, because many of these games end up in other episodes. And I don't know, I'm a sucker for fun things, and you all play a role in that every single day, whether you like to believe it or not. To me, I feel like my purpose is to earn my sunset. And I like to imagine everyone who watches my videos standing behind me watching the sunset with me, right? Daydreaming buffoonery aside, Kickle Cubicle is one of the cutest games on the NES, and we can thank Irem for it. It's a simple game, the setting of the game gets frozen, but Kickle is immune to it, and because he's unaffected, he goes out of his way to collect dream bags from multiple stages to thaw out the land. It's easy, it's genuinely easy, and the way that it works, we can blow ice to turn enemies into blocks, which can be used to bridge gaps. We can also create ice pegs, which allow us to line up our blocks where we need them. Eventually, we'll run into other puzzle mechanics, but I'll let you be surprised by those. This game deserves to be in your library, and it's not expensive at all. Before we continue, I do want to point out that we are currently working towards a major milestone of 8,000 subscribers, and if we accomplish that, I'll make a special video of the community's choosing. Currently, roughly 67% of the folks watching my videos aren't subscribed. So feel free to join the community. It's a great time and I'd love to have you here. Let's get back to the action. Tetris took the world by storm and once people saw the success of Tetris, the floodgates opened to create a fuck ton of Tetris inspired games. From Columns to Candy Crush, we saw this unique progression of matching things, and I 100% allocate that influence to Alexei Pajitnov. Now one thing people don't realize is that with the success of Tetris, he was considered the god of puzzle games, and he did tons of consulting or development for other companies. And that's where Hattress came into play. Hattress was developed by Paragraph for Bulletproof Software, led by Hank Rogers. For anyone who's seen the 2023 film Tetris, he's the guy that Taron Egerton plays, the person who brought Tetris to America and convinced Nintendo to put it on the Game Boy. He also stood by Pagetnoff throughout the years to protect him from the exceptionally predatory nature of companies that held his licensing rights for Tetris hostage. Eventually, they created the Tetris Company that still to this day protects the interests of Alexei Pagetnoff. Now, Hatchis is a simple game. Some might say it's stupid, but I, I think it's cool. Instead of blocks, we stack hats, and it's incredibly easy, and it's fun, and it's relaxing. 
Who knows? Maybe you'll find it relaxing as well. Bubble Bobble is one of my favorite arcade games, but what's so interesting to me is that I've never played any other games in the franchise. I guess Bust a Move technically counts, but in terms of baseline Bubble Bobble, I've never really dived deep in understanding how the franchise evolved, and I know that one day when I tackle Taito, I'll be playing a lot of it. Bubble Bobble is a relaxing game. You just run around as Bub or Bob spitting bubbles at enemies, and then running up and kicking the bubbles. Occasionally we'll get power-ups that I've never really cared to understand. You get so in the groove that you just kind of zone out, think of the Tetris effect. In fact, if there ever was an arcade game I could play that really afforded you the opportunity to make your quarters go far and give you those feel-good vibes, I would have to give it to Bubble Bobble. It's not absent of challenge, but it is wholesome. I actually talked about it in a video I did with Jank Jesus the other day for a recurring series comparing the shared games between the Sega Master System and the NES. So if you want to check that out, I'll put it down in the description below as well. It's a good watch. When talking about relaxing games, you have to include a game that has a psychological effect tied to it. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, Tetris manifested what is known as the Tetris Effect. The Tetris Effect essentially is a weird phenomenon where your mind adapts to focus on tasks and make them work, or in some cases you dream about the game, but to me, it's all about being productive, zoning out while your brain just makes it work. It's almost a meditative trance in some ways, time slips away, and all that matters is filling in the gaps. But if you don't want to look that deep into it, then at the surface, it's still a badass puzzle game. The best puzzle game I've played to date, and one that has done so much for the genre. Alexei Pajitnov's idea came from a really tough time. A time where the Soviet Union took everything from you. Your property, your money, and ultimately your identity. It all belonged to Mother Russia. And I've mentioned it a lot, but I have nothing but eternal hatred for any company that took advantage of Alexei. I'm so happy he has his game back in his own terms. If you want a good, clean, fun game, this is it. I know that as the lines progress, it will get faster and faster and it will get more difficult, but guess what? You get better. And that's a magical thing. When I think of relaxing games, I look no further than Kirby's adventure. In fact, to me, Kirby in every instance of his existence has been in games that are lofty and fun. In fact, it's an allegory to my constant existence. Suck in everything like yesterday's problem and blow them out with a casual dominance that makes you feel like you're in control. That's nice to me. It isn't much of a brain hug as say Tetris was, but I have a very strong nostalgia for Tetris. And to me, if I would have never played Tetris, this game still would have been at the top of this list. Kirby's adventure is simple. We play as Kirby going to restore the Star Rod and bring sweet dreams back to dreamland. And like I alluded to earlier, it does have the copy mechanic, which was the first time that we would see it. This game is almost completely absent of stress and everything about it is relaxing. The music, the visuals, and of course, the perpetual feel-good story that tends to come along with Kirby games. And that's it for today's episode. What did you think of this list? I know some of you do yoga to death metal and work out to classical music. So what we perceive as relaxing might be different. And I would love to hear which NES games you consider relaxing in your own way down below in the comments section. Now, if you made it to the end of this video, you're already home in our community. We're a group of folks who enjoy remembering a time when life was just a little bit easier to live. And if that aligns with what you seek in life, then feel free to join. I'd love to have you. Finally, the single most important thing you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the videos and the projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, Fortify her out.